Hi, welcome to the Freeman Conversations. I'm Jobert Oka, the online editor of the Freeman. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is Power Women, and this is our way of paying tribute to women who are not afraid to make a difference. We are live here at the Pandawi City Hall at the office of the Chief of Staff of uh, the City Mayor, and we are talking to a woman who is not afraid to make a difference. She is probably one of the most recognizable faces in Mandawi City, and of course she holds several leadership positions, being Chief of Staff, as well as Assistant Dean of the University of San Jose Recoleta School of Law, and of course, former leader of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, both here in Cebu City and in Eastern Visayas. I'm talking to no less than Attorney Elaine Batan. Attorney, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. And welcome to this maiden episode of Power Women. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We're celebrating Women's Month. I know, I know, and I'm <laughs> glad to be part of, of this uh, program, and I'm very honored that you have chosen me to be one of the empowered women in Cebu. The honor is ours. Thank, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. Uh, by the way, congratulations on the successful staging of Vagina Monologues. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Um, it was a very wonderful experience. You, you were once again, uh, re you once again read this year. Yes, yes. I was one of um, the Vagina Warriors. Mm -hmm. We call ourselves that together with our sisters. We've been doing it for several years now and I have been a part of um, the, the advocacy since 2014. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the Vagina Monologues because for many, the concept seems to be a little vague. Because the title itself is very intriguing. Yes, But yes. it is actually a series of pieces written by Eva Eisler. Mm -hmm. And it's actually dedicated to empower women and to pursue the advocacy of women fight against the abuses right. of uh, women and to empower them, to allow them to embrace their femininity to embrace what it is and how wonderful it is to be a woman. And we're doing it on stage. We are doing it on stage. We're doing it live without any um, prompter mm. to, 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 to guide us. So we memorize our scripts mm. and we have to prepare it. So we're on our own, we're on stage. I heard that everyone there on that stage are empowered women. I would like to think so. The fact that we took courage to be there on stage to do our pieces, to do our monologues on our own, with people watching, probably making or waiting for us to make mistakes. <laughs> I think that that is empowerment enough. Yeah, but the women of today are not afraid to make mistakes. I believe so. That's that's one of the things that I'm very proud of. We we get to see uh, women who are bold, uh, women who are not afraid, women who are not afraid to make mistakes, and if they do, they embrace it. Right. Um, I'm glad you mentioned those because my next question was supposed to be how would you describe the modern Filipina, the modern Cebuana? The modern Filipina and the modern Cebuana to me is somebody who is unafraid of doing things on her own, unafraid to speak out, speak yeah. her mind, unafraid to take the risks, unafraid to do what she wants to do and um, to me the modern Filipina and the modern Savona is comfortable of mm -hmm. what she is and um, who she is. She is uh, emboldened to me and she is happy. And most of all, to me, a modern Savona is somebody who is involved, somebody who is not complacent or passive anymore, right, yeah. somebody who takes part uh, in anything. Just like I said, just like I said, a while ago, somebody who speaks out, speaks mm -hmm. her mind does things and take risks. Major takeaways there, um, the modern Cebuana or Filipina and Filipina mm -hmm. is not afraid to take risks yes. and is comfortable in her own skin and mm -hmm. her own voice. Yes. Uh, may I ask uh, the major risks you've taken <laughs> oh. in your career as a lawyer and as a woman? Well, one of the, well, one of the biggest leap of faith perhaps that I have taken was to enter into public and government service. Mm -hmm. Um, when it's I passed the bar, never not easy, easy to be in governance. Not at all, not at all. And um, it, it is the first time for me to, to uh, take the giant leap and, and giant step to join um, public service and serve in the city of Mandawe. For many years since I passed the bar, since 2005, I have been very comfortable in, in the practice of law. 
me being a lawyer, doing practice, private practice, um, focusing on, on corporate and civil law, and just the academe. That was my routine, that was my exposure, uh, and of course my involvement with the IDP. But um, getting into public office and government service was actually, to me, a big risk because of the fact that there is a big responsibility right. that I had to take. And it also entailed giving up a big chunk of my private practice which actually, um, one, was my comfort zone with regards to my fulfillment as a lawyer, and second, and to be frank about it, um, financially, it gives you a float, uh, and I had to give up a lot of those. Um, coming into public service, the demands of your time, right. the pressure, the expectations, um, how you deal with uh, people, the concern of every citizen, of every Madawiana, of every client of the city is too vast, too varied, too huge, and it's yeah. what we handle and we tackle every day. Not to mention taking care of uh, the, the mayor himself. Yes. The business of the mayor. Exactly. You know, you have to uh, balance the affairs uh, of the mayor vis a vis uh, the needs uh, of the city, which we have to look after foremost. You know, so uh, it's it's quite a big responsibility, and um, that's a uh, that's me taking a big leap from my comfort zone onto government service, and uh, I'm surviving. <laughs> and you're, you're doing your public service alongside your duties in USJR School of Law. Yes. How do you manage your time? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a matter. Of probably yeah, a lot of people uh, are actually asking, no. Um, how yeah, I because um, you're not only assistant dean, yes. you're also teaching. Yes, I am. Well, you know, the, the, the demands or the requirement and my time with uh, the School of Law um, is actually after my work here mm -hmm. in City Hall, which is uh, after 5. Yeah. Um, classes in the School of Law start at 5.30. Um, my job as assistant dean is actually uh, administrative mm -hmm. uh, in nature. I am just glad that we have a very strong support team and support group from our faculty and um, from our religious and lay administrators. And most of that, because we also have weekends, then I, I get to do um, weekend schedule, which is Saturday and Sunday. My classes, uh, well, honestly, I have diluted, um, taken a few, few units off from my regular schedule because again, of, of the demands of my work here in the city. Uh, but I still handle a few subjects, most of which are um, scheduled on Saturdays and Sundays. So I get to balance it. If I may backtrack a bit, what yes. made you say yes to the uh, chief of staff? One, I am a pure and true blooded Madawihanan, okay. and I'm very proud of it. Um, like I said, the woman of the day is involved and would want to be involved and would want to take part of change. And that is what I wanted to, to do for Mandawe. I cannot just you know, continue to sit and complain mm. or try to see and say on my own, just alone, and say um, this should have been done or yeah. this should have been done better. Mm. It would have been better if it were done this way. So when the opportunity came for me, to be involved, um, that's when I said yes, because I wanted to be part of the change. I wanted to be part of the system. Uh, and most of all, uh, I believe in, and I, I firmly believe in the leadership um, and advocacy of our mayor, Mayor Luigi Kisunding, um, with his plans and dreams for the city, and I wanted to be part of it. Very nice. Speaking of leadership, as a woman leader, how do you define leadership? Well, take a woman leader, just a leader. The leader to me is somebody who is able to allow others to look, not just look outward in the same direction as him, but he or she is also able to empower all those around him to lead their direction towards that common goal. And um, a leader to me is somebody who takes everybody together towards that direction. He does not leave anybody behind, and uh, a leader is somebody also who knows how to empower and inspire others towards that common goal. Selflessness. 
Yes. It's, it's giving a part of yourself. So to me, leadership is also service. Mm -hmm. Service not just to um, the community, to the organization um, that you are in, but it also means giving a part of yourself to your constituents and to those who are or who comprise that organization. Can it be too exhausting at times? Of course it is. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It you, is. You've held several leadership posts. It is, and it takes a lot of your time, but you know, at the end of the day, when you know you have actually done something, that is the ultimate and intangible reward that you actually get. And you get that certain sense of fulfillment um, from within. And you know, you get to see that at the end of the day, all your efforts are worth it. I mean, you don't get there without actually giving a part of yourself. You don't get there without sacrificing a bit. And, the journey wherever you are, whether it's towards your ambition, whether it's towards the goal for your organization, will never be an easy track. But um, what's important is that you you keep on. You know that, that's why to me, um, a leader it's it's like a bus ride. All of you get there. All of you 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 get to the destination together. Does it matter if people at the end of the day appreciate or acknowledge what you do? Not really, um, because. For one, it's it's you who actually sees the the results. A thank you or or an act of um, gratitude from people is an added bonus. Well, it's an icing on on the cake, but it's not the cake really. Um, at the end of the day, it's you who will actually see the results, and I think to me that should be enough. It's um, the thank you. It's something that you should not expect. Because if you expect that, then it means to say you are doing something because you want to be recognized. And that should not be it. You do something because you want and you believe that this is the right thing to do. And you do it because it's the change that you want and you envision. You do it because you know it's for the common good. You do it without expecting anything in return. Do you have the same set of values as far as leadership is concerned when it comes to your posts? Or do you compartmentalize? Um, some of which, some of which, yes, I do. Um, um, like, like being able to look after your subordinates, giving them proper and due recognition, um, inspiring them and empowering them. I think that applies to each and every um, organization or office that I have been to. Being able to maintain good relationship uh, with right. people—that's that's a given in anything and in everything that we do. However, there are um, other traits that may or may not be applicable um, to the other organizations or other fields that I am in. So that's when I get to compartmentalize everything. Mm -hmm. Speaking of um, being able to deal with people, how do you do that? Especially in public service, you deal with people from all walks of life, yes. from kings and queens to people in the streets. Well, um, you just have to be flexible. You just need to adapt and, and to know and to try to look at the background of the people uh, that you are talking to. You know, I agree. Being here in, in Madawe, being in public service, you get to see and deal with a lot of people. It's very diverse. Yeah. Very diverse. It's, it's, it's often, um, you know, you have to zone out. One minute you're talking to probably um, a senator who's here, mm -hmm. and then when they go, somebody's waiting for you, asking for, um, let's say, financial assistance, asking for help because um, they, they have problems with their drainage, and then the next thing, you have to settle disputes uh, between neighbors and the city, complaining mm -hmm. from this business and, and things like that. But um, it's a matter of being able to adapt um, to their needs and to know what they actually want. And, uh, mm -hmm. I believe it takes a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, there was one answer from a Miss Universe winner in 2000, 2000 or 2001, Lara Dutta from India. Mm. And she said that what makes women leaders different from men is a certain amount of sensitivity. Yes. Do you agree with it? That's one. Um, a certain amount of sensitivity. And if I may add to that, um, I think women are more patient than men. We tend to, you know, um, be more composed, mm. be more relaxed, and um, we tend to, to, to extend our patience to, to a certain limit. We don't necessarily 
you know, blow our top right away, and we, we, we were able. It's I think it's a skill, you know, when you say maximum tolerance. <laughs> I think it's a skill. It's a skill that's uniquely um, owned by women. And I think that's very important when dealing with people, especially when you're dealing with um, issues that are um, quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, complaints, for example. Exactly. How do you deal with complaints? And I believe you deal with them every day. Yes, it's a bit. It's 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 a bit. It's an ability I think that you've um, developed and learned um, through time. Ability to know how to mediate, mm -hmm. and um, it, it it takes a lot of. Um, what is important is I, I think you know you, and you have the ability to listen, to listen to both sides, and 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 to show to to people that you are impartial. I think it, they, what 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 is important to me is that you are able to to show to them that, especially in my line of work now, that they matter, what they have to say matter, that they are important because I think people come to the office because they want to be heard. And we, we value that. That's why our office is open to anybody um, who, who have needs, whether it's from an ordinary parking ticket or a problem with them being demolished in a few weeks' time or them without a job, them want, needing um, assistance for graduation, to, to anything. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's important that um, you have the ability to listen. Empathy. Um, is very important because if you cannot show to them that you understand them, that you you are able to relate to their needs, and, and then then how else can you you know these are the only things that these people often hold on to. Mm -hmm. The reason that they come to you is because they know that they can ask help or that you could be of help to them, mm -hmm. and I would not want to deny them of that. Is that how you also define genuine public service? I believe so. Um, to me, genuine public service is really being able um, to be there for those who actually need it. And it's also being sensitive um, mm -hmm. to the needs. Um, oftentimes, there's that uh, need to be uh, even a step ahead uh, of them um, to oversee and foresee what could be the problem and to be always, always ready with solutions. In IBP? Yes. Uh, how is your leadership? Um, experience in IVP. You're dealing with, you must have dealt with uh, very strong personalities, yes. lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, you know, it wasn't an easy feat for me considering that one, I was the first um, woman governor mm. in um, the Eastern Visayas region. I was the youngest um, president of IVP Cebu City chapter, and I was the only woman governor sitting in the, the national board um, during my term but it turned out that everything went or was to to my advantage actually with me being a, a woman um, woman at that um, in the national office and in the national board me being again the youngest and the only woman I was able to turn things to to, to, to my advantage by um, being heard by them being given the opportunity there was actually no um, unequal treatment I was treated as, as a governor as a member of the board with special treatment they call me Bunso because I was young <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and um, every time there were issues that were that were tackled um, they were used to me speaking my, my mind out and um, resolutions that we, uh, that I bring in on, on the table um, either on my own initiative or through uh, the different chapters in my region um, were in fact um, given um, due, due credit and credits and were, were approved and taken up by the board. For the region, um, I believe we had a very, very successful um, two-year term. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to go around um, so the, the governor, region. Uh, yes. IDP yes. has a two-year term. We have a two-year term. What about the presidency? The same. The same. What's unique about um, the president is that for, for this term, you get to elect the executive vice president from among you, mm -hmm. from among the governors. And the executive vice president will move, at the end of our term, he moves on to be the national president. I see. Okay. okay. And then um, it was very successful. We were uh, able to, to do 
and we were able to introduce a, a regional legal aid day, which is already um, in place, um, beginning my, my term and, and succeedingly. It's a regional legal aid day for all, all the regions. We were able to pass several resolutions that would benefit not only the regions, but all the chapters in the country. And um, we've had a very successful regional convention and um, legal aid summit for, for my term. So it was being, fun. being a very young leader, one of the youngest, how did you make the senior, the more senior members listen to your voice? Well, it's a matter of, like I said, there is, and I always value the importance of speaking out. Because if you don't, and you do not let your voice be heard, you do not give your input and what you think, how can you introduce change to the system? How can you put in um, the changes that you would want, the improvements that you would want for your organization or for your chapter? It takes a lot of courage and bravery to do it, but you have to do it. The fact that you took on that responsibility, that it means to say that you are courageous enough and brave enough um, to see and to do what is incumbent and expected of you. Um, and uh, I think I was um, just lucky that in, in the organizations that I was in, age was actually not a, an issue, an issue. Okay. neither was gender. Do we have enough laws that protect the interests of women? Well, well, we have the Magna Carta for women, and um, we also have um, women that prevents and um, addresses issues with relation, in relation to violence against women, particularly the Republic Act 9262. We also have laws that um, allow um, women, um, married women or unmarried women, um, leave when they need to attend to, to their children or when they give birth. I think we have laws that are sufficient to address, but do you, I, I, are, are you, if you're asking me if it's enough, then I would say no. Um, there are still a lot of laws that uh, we need to, to, to change mm. and to amend. What are these? One of which to me, um, in order to, to, to put in equality between men and women is to me the law under the Family Code and under the Revised Penal Code, uh, particularly the Revised Penal Code, that defines differently the issue on infidelity with regards okay. to married men and married women. Mm -hmm. um, you For see, the benefit of our viewers. Yes, because a married woman who you know um, has relationship with, with other men mm -hmm. would be sued and maybe accused of adultery. And easily, you can just prove it by near having relationship or doing carnal knowledge with a man other than your husband. While there is actually, and, and especially if she gets pregnant and it's not the husband that is the father, automatically then that's a prima facie case for adultery on the part of the woman. On the other hand, a married man who impregnates a woman other than their husband does not get sued for adultery. Why is that? That is the law. I don't know. When we, I remember in law school when, when we actually asked our teacher, the only explanation that my teacher in law school gave me was the fact that Congress and our lawmakers were dominated by men. At that point. And they were trying to protect themselves. Okay. Um, I don't know if it was meant to be a joke or that was a reality. Well, come to think of it, majority of the legislators are indeed um, from the male gender. Um, probably when the family code and the vice penal code was adopted at the time. The only logical reason that um, I could think of is the fact that it is the woman who actually brings or knows who the, the, the father is and, and holds the honor of the child um, in, in the family. But to me, that should not be the case. You know, um, infidelity is infidelity, whether it's committed by the husband or by the wife. Um, a man can only be sued if he lives with a woman, not her wife. And the further requirement is that they are living together as husband and wife and in a scandalous manner. If they are I'll not living fine. together, exactly. Scandalous manner. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's the point there. It means to say that it is more difficult to sue a husband who is not loyal or committing acts of infidelity 
compared to to the woman and i think that should be amended um for several years now i i know there were bills that were passed um but more often this has not yet been taken up in congress from what i know that there is uh, is, is that there's another bill from one of the congress but here from Cebu who passed the bill and we do hope that during this um, term that law will be passed already. Yeah, because definitely if uh, I'm a man yes. and if I want to live with someone else exactly. aside from my wife, mm -hmm. I definitely would not want it to be scandalous. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, like I said, that's why to me that, that, that's just one of the many laws that I think um, that can be amended. There are a lot of laws that are already outdated and um, needs to be adapted with the times. Um, in order to be more attuned to the needs um, of the women. Um, the Magna Carta for Women, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, the anti-violence against women laws. Yes. Is it enforcement enough? Do you well, think they are enforced properly? Well, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to, to pass the law. The more important thing is to be able to actually um, enforce it. Yeah. The challenge there is it's a, it has to be a concerted effort not only on the pillars of justice, meaning the police, mm -hmm. uh, the prosecutor, and, and the judges, but it also has to be with the victims themselves. More often, we find a lot of cases being filed at the onset when the victim was experiencing or has just experienced the abuse, and then later on withdraws and retracts from filing the case because of the fact that the husband or the partner has lured the mm. woman again um, if not intimidated together, exactly or, or intimidated the woman and lured them back together in order for the woman to drop the case and then the cycle continues i think the challenge there is um, to continue to empower women to be like i said to be unafraid you know um, to, to learn to stand up for herself and and to know when it's never okay to be abused or to know when abuse has already set in and to draw a line already at that point that that's one of the challenges now in a largely patriarchal society like the philippines how do we make women unafraid well it's it's, it's a matter of giving them a lot of opportunities and options um to to be able to stand on their own because more often, the reason why women think that they cannot stand on their own, it's because they do not have the opportunity um, to empower them, to, 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 to build their self-confidence, and to know that they too can, can be self-sufficient. They have to be self-reliant. Know they, their worth. The know their least. worth, exactly. Know their worth be comfortable with what they are and, and, and just believe in themselves and know that they can do it without the help of any person. I'm interested to know, um, you've held several leadership positions, I'm sure not only in your professional life but also in, in your student mm -hmm. life. Where do these values come from, your leadership principles? Well, I would like to say it's, it's mainly from, from my parents. Um, we, I, I've come from a middle class family. Um, I've, I've been taught when I was young um, not to take the easy route. Um, my, my parents have actually taught me the value of you know, the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. you, want, you want this results, then, or you want this, then you have to work hard for it. It cannot be given to you as easily as, as you want it to be. And um, you have to take responsibility for, for all your actions. You do good, you get a prize, you get recognized. You do bad, then you have to be a cerebral for it, and then you have to learn. You have to learn from it. And um, uh, another value um, that, that my parents have, have taught me, and my family has taught me, ever since I was I was young, was um, exposing me um, to different people from from different walks of life, and, and then you get to realize that while you're living comfortably. There are a lot of people out there um, who are not, and um, the value of giving and the value of sharing is very important, and, and the belief that you don't hold on to anything material, because the more that you give it away, the more it comes back. How was your student life at the University of San Carlos? 
San Carlos, it was fun. I, 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 I had the opportunity, in fact, to rekindle ties, ties with them. Um, last week, I was the speaker for the awards in San Carlos for the Outstanding Leader, Outstanding Graduate, and the Outstanding Organization. I was also a recipient um, of that award. Um, and I got to actually recall um, how, how college was uh, back then. I had a very balanced college life. I was a government scholar of Pantawe, so I had to maintain a grade. Mm. But I was involved with the student court. I, I was a student coordinator of the Student Affairs Office. I was a member and officer of the University of San Carlos Junior JCs, which was actually um, very vital uh, and played a, an important role in my development um, as a leader. And um, I think that was where I also was able to hone um, my skill and my ability to deal with people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. That was actually the, the exposure that I got. We got to, I had my first experience of traveling alone without my parents uh, because of the organizations that I was in. Where did you go? What we went do? to we went to national conventions um, of the junior JCs. We had leadership trainings in Baguio, representing the school. Um, I was sent to attend the junior APEC um, summit. That was the first time that I get to meet at that time President Fidel Ramos, um, who was our president then. Um, I had different exposures, and, and and I was very grateful and thankful for the opportunities that was given to me. Right. Who do you look up to in the area of leadership and well, in the area of law? Well, um, in the area of, of, of leadership, um, I have been and I am still a fan of Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton to me was an epitome of a mother, of an empowered woman, of a leader. She was never shaken um, and then hold on to her marriage, held on to her commitment uh, as a wife. Um, despite the weaknesses of, of her husband, embraced it and was there for him. She was an epitome of class and elegance as a first lady to mm -hmm. me. And then she went on to make a name for herself mm -hmm. away from just being the first lady of the United States of America right. to being the senator, a secretary of state. More importantly, she was a lawyer. I have read her biography and I was very fascinated with her advocacy when she was still a law student mm. up until the time when she was practicing her field she was involved in a non-government organization did a lot of pro bono cases and um, um, then the defeat right. in her presidency she sh was not able to break that glass ceiling mm. up there but um, how she took it um, and, and how she embraced failure no matter how painful, is it something that every woman, every individual must must follow suit mm -hmm. and, and must learn must learn to do. Because to me, in our lives, um, failure is inevitable. Um, there will always be bumps along the road, but what's important is that you are able to accept it and you are to embrace it. And you should know all the time that life goes on. Mm -hmm. There will be several opportunities for you. That. To me, she's, she's, she's um, the epitome of the kind of woman that I would like to be. Another, of course, is my mother. Okay. My mother was a government employee. She was a mother of five. However, um, she was somebody I will always look up to in terms of being selfless. How she took care of my father when, when he was sick. How um, she took care of us and the discipline that she has um, inculcated in us and the values um, that she has um, bestowed on us um, to, to today a lot of most of, of what I am and the discipline that I have had is, is mainly because of her. And of course the lawyers that I look up to, um, I don't need to go too far, these are my aunts, they were the two deans mm. of, of the two schools, San Carlos and, and San Jose. Dean Alice Batan and um, Dean Cora Valencia. Do you think consciously of your gender um, on when you do something? Honestly, not. Um, no, no, I don't. I am oftentimes more conscious, sometimes of my age, 
than my gender. <laughs> because sometimes I, I, I feel that um, I'm too young to be doing these things um, compared to, to, to the circle um, that I am in and, and the bracket and the age bracket of, of, of most. Mm. Um, but gender, no. My being a woman was never an issue. I believe that my being a woman was never a hindrance um, to the successes and the opportunities um, that I have had uh, uh, in my life. No, not at all. One of the perhaps women of the hour, uh, Meghan Markle, mm -hmm. future wife of Prince Harry, yes. said in one of the events in the UK, women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it and people need to be encouraged to listen. Do you May, agree with her? Yes, foremost, I must just say that I envy her because I love Prince Sari. <laughs> and she is the envy of most women, I believe, you know. Um, and yes, I agree with her. The voice is just inside you. And I've always believed and I've always said it that, you know, a lot of bad things happen, not because there are a lot of bad people who do it, but it's because there are so many good people who keep quiet and silent about it. And, 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 and I believe that. And, and I think that all it takes for, for good, for, for evil no? um, to succeed is for good men to do nothing. And then I, I think that a woman needs to know and needs to find her voice because that voice is just there. It's just a matter of taking the courage to speak out, learning and knowing what it is that you want, what is the change that you want, and, and, and learning how to speak and what to say. That is the most important thing, and you only are able to do that if you are empowered. If you know that it's so nice to be a woman, it's fun to be a woman, and um, there are a lot of well advantages of being a woman, and you need to take and grab that advantage. I might be asking you to, to look at the crystal ball, but as yes. far as women's rights and are concerned, women empowerment is concerned, where are we heading, at least in the Philippines? I am seeing a very positive light for the women in the Philippines. I have seen a lot of changes um, with regards to the attitude of women and how the society sees and perceives women. We don't judge them anymore um, based on, on their gender, but we get to judge them based on their capacity and capability and what they have to offer to, to society. Um, I have seen also a lot of change in the women of the day that the Filipino woman is more bold. It's more, they're more outspoken. Um, there are a lot of offices and, and, and places and profession that you know, people perceived for so many years is only fit for women. Let's start with public service and mm. government service, elective posts. Yes. Before Congress is dominated by, by men, mostly men. There's could that the perception. Reason. Could be the reason for that. <laughs> of that law. <laughs> yes. But now, but now, um, you will see a lot of women politicians getting the posts. Mm. You go to the judiciary. The concept of, 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 of most men, most people is that being a judge, being a justice is a man's job. Mm. But no, you go to the aviation, the airline industry, before there were no women pilots. But um, recently, um, I was talking to my cousin, he showed me a photo of um, this airline company celebrating Women's Month and showed mm. me a photo and there were more than 50 pilots, women pilots um, in the industry. Um, captains of that, not just mm. first officers. So you would see that the times have in fact changed and um, the society has slowly embraced the equality of women uh, and men. Um, even in law school, you mm. will already see that it's a lot, there are a lot of of um, women, law students, uh, who would want to be lawyers already. And I'm sure it applies to most most profession. And I think it has something to do with the different um, organizations really advocating for um, women empowerment. Women in leadership posts, while we already have um, substantial numbers, mm -hmm. is it enough? Are these numbers enough? 
Well, I think we need more women. I think we need more women. You know, um, the, 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 the society needs um, more women to, to do what is incumbent upon them, to bring change, to allow women to inculcate and embrace their femininity, to campaign and advocate for the different abuses and the different um, violence that, that women have experienced through the years, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. And um, I hope that, that the changes that are happening here in the Philippines would ripple, not only in Asia, but all over the world. Attorney, your message to your fellow women and men, to the men. Well, to the men, <laughs> watch out for us. No. <laughs> well, um, actually, um, I'm, I'm um, very glad that, you know, celebrating women should not be in March mm -hmm. only. Celebrating women should always be um, a 24-7, 365-day um, activity. And my message to my fellow women out there is that we should always know and feel that in all ways and in um, all the ways, we are special, we are capable, and we should always be empowered to speak up and um, to be brave enough to do the things that we need to do. And never forget that life will always be about risk. And the modern women of the day is one who will never be afraid to take risks. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank Attorney you. Elaine Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank for you. this opportunity to be with you today Thank and you. for joining us in this maiden episode of yes. Power Women. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank there you. you have it. Our first guest in Power Women, Attorney Elaine Batan of Mandawi City. She's the Chief of Staff of the Mayor as well as the Assistant Dean at the University of San Jose Recoleta's School of Law and Professor at the School of Law as well, former leader of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. Thank you very much for joining us in today's episode and please do watch out for our other segments, um, special episodes next week as we continue with our Power Women series in the Freeman Conversation, our special tribute to women who are not afraid to make a difference. I'm Jobert Okao, the online editor of the Freeman. Thank you very much for joining us. Join us once again next time here in the Freeman Conversations.